Hello, my name is Rob Grant and I'm going to talk about quantitative research design in international development. Now, as you can see to begin with, I'm going to start by offering the image of a fish in a rather unusual position. And this comes from an image uh, that was offered by one of my favourite philosophers, William James, in his book of essays and lectures, Pragmatism. Now, William James pointed out that there are many sort of fish which, although they spend most of their time living in the water, do occasionally leap out of the water and either take a large gulp of oxygen or, like flying fish, actually fly above the water for a short distance. Now, these two realms of water and oxygen he used to discuss the relationship between logic, theory, claims about the truth that we make in abstract terms, and experience of reality. Now, to put this in terms of international developments, we may have some theories in international developments that may concern, for example, something like education. We may think that's education has some sort of connection to fertility. Is there a relationship between education and fertility? And we may give policy advice about the likely impact of greater secondary education for women and family sizes, for example. Or, on a more abstract and economic level, we might talk about, well, what should the exchange rate policy of a country be? Should you allow your exchange rates to fall, um, so that's promote exports, or should you keep your exchange rate higher so you can buy essential goods that you need for your economy? So you might investigate the effects of exchange rate and the relationship of that with rural well-being. We know that in many developing countries, um, most people still live in rural areas, so they, a lot of them are engaged in agriculture. So you think that if the exchange rate falls, then they will be able to export more things. Their exports will do better, so that will benefit them. On the other hand, if the exchange rate if the exchange rate falls, then essential things that they need, like the foods which they don't produce themselves, or medicines, or soaps, and so on, other things they need may become more expensive. So it could cut both ways. And similarly, we can talk in abstract terms about the relationship between education and fertility. But these are all abstract arguments and policy discussions. Now, James's point and the point of research design is that this is no good existing on its own, divorced from re reality and experience. We also want to look at the real world of, in education terms, schools, teachers, families, um, in exchange rate terms, well, banks, actual money, looking at deals, looking at farmer livelihoods. All these things which we can experience by going and observing reality and talking to people, we need to see whether or not what happens here corresponds with our theoretical discussions. And the link is research design. What's the logic of how we're going to apply things we can find out here to the sort of academic or policy related language that we use up here? And the thing we have to bear in mind from James is that while James acknowledged that it's very, very useful to um, go into the realm of pure logic and to make sure your arguments make sense and to develop theories that you can test by analysing the logical relationships among these terms up here, if you're a fish and you leap out of the water, you might get a nice gob of oxygen or escape from a predator for a while if you're a flying fish. But if you spend too long up here and don't end up back down here, your fate may be similar to the fate of the fish. So research design is the, the link between these two things. Now let's go into a little bit more detail about research design. What's the connection between research design and research method? And what about quantitative? I've not mentioned quantitative at all yet, and yet that's meant to be uh, a big part of this uh, lecture. Well, if we expand the diagram and lose the actual fish for a minute, we can see that whereas research design is what I mean by the overall structure of the argument, yeah, how is things that we can find out in reality going to affect the theory that we put together, and how are we then going to perhaps test that theory by looking at reality? So these are the two main directions that like you can build theory and you can test theory. Sometimes you do both at the same time. Um, but that logical structure, once we've decided the overall structure of which way we're going to go, or whether we're going to go both ways, and um, 
how we're going to use evidence, what sort of things we want to know in order to support the things that we're claiming and vice versa, what sort of things we want to know to test the things we claim. The nitty gritty of, well, who exactly do you talk to down here? What questions do we ask them? How do we analyze their questions? These are all research methods. So you want, in the, the educational example, getting down to the nitty gritty about comparing particular women and their families who have not had secondary education, particular women and their families who have had secondary education, how you find those women, how you find out what their fertility is, what their education is, and how you analyze that difference between them, if there is a difference. These are all specific research methods which we need to decide later on. On the quantitative side, well, if the methods turn out to be quantitative, the ways you get your sample, the questions you ask and the way you analyse it, and in this lecture they are going to be then, if you are using largely quantitative techniques of sampling and analysis, then you have quantitative research methods and the research design, there will be a quantitative research design. The research design itself isn't quantitative or qualitative. It depends on the, the nitty gritty of the methods you're going to use. Having said that, it's not a, these, the methods and the design are not entirely independent in the same way that an architect may in principle be able to design a building, get the shape of the building before they think about the nitty gritty of what the materials it were made of, but of course it would be a foolish architect that did not think about how strong the materials would be and what the possibilities are before they built their building. So there's, there is a relationship between the two things. Um, for example, if you're someone that just can't stand maths, can't do it, or can't pay someone to do it for you, that's going to rule out these things. So you're going to end up with non-quantitative techniques, qualitative techniques, and therefore qualitative research design. If you're somebody that, that uh, thinks that policymakers listen to quantitative techniques, even though they may be no more valid, policymakers are impressed by, by quantitative techniques, you're going to want to put some of these things in, so you're going to end up with qualitative, quantitative research design. Um, if, on the other hand, you think that the things that you're researching don't, are very, very difficult to measure, they don't lend themselves to being measured, and therefore quantitative analysis, you're going to reject largely these techniques, and you'll end up with qualitative research methods, and therefore qualitative research design. Also, as we'll see, some of the techniques that we actually use to make this, this jump and to analyse arguments depends specifically on the quantitative nature of that technique. So some, some techniques give you certain shapes of overall argument, as we'll see. But today we're, we're concerned mostly with the research design in terms of the overall logic of the argument. We're only concerned with these research methods here insofar as they affect the kind of designs that are possible. Now, there are some desirable characteristics of any research design. Um, some of these you have met before, it's possible, but I'll just go through these again because they'll come up again in, in this, during this lecture. For a start, there's reliability, which is the extent that uh, if you think you're measuring something like the educational level of someone, if you if you go on two, if you went, went to, on two occasions and talked to the same family, the same women, you should find the same answers, the same measures for the level of fertility they have and the level of education they have. If it depends upon the mood you're in or the way you put the question exactly from day to day, possibly not very reliable. Replicability, similar concept, but this is more concerned with could somebody else, having read your research, go to the same village or go to a different context and and repeat the procedures that you've done in a way that would give comparable results in a meaningful way. If not, if it depends on who you are or secret knowledge that you have or a relationship that you have with your um, interviews that no one else could possibly have for some reason, then it's, that limits replicability of your study. So these are related, but you can distinguish them. Then we have a group that are validities. There's construct validity. To what extent are the, the measurements that you're making so here we're concerned with quantitative measurements. To what extent are the measurements you're making um, actually measures of the same of the, of the things that you think you're trying to measure? For example, education. If I want to, if I think there is a relationship between education and fertility, if I measure education in terms of years of time spent in school, is that sufficiently good? If in fact the, the quality of education is the thing that matters, and that there could be some women who have spent many years in primary school, but the, the primary school is hopeless, 
whereas women in a different location have been to high quality primary schools for less time, then the number of years is not going to be a good guide to the education they've got. So that, that construct would not be valid. Then we have internal validity, which is to do with the, the logic of the relationships you find among the variables that you're measuring, specifically causality. If you claim that within the group of, of, of women you studied, that there was an effect between their education and the fertility of them, their, their families, then that would be internal validity, without considering whether or not it applies in other locations and places. Which is in contrast with external validity, which is the question of, if we go to a few villages or a few areas and find that there seems to be some sort of pattern in our data, where, to look at the other example, when exchange rates in the country in the country was going down, the farmers were getting worse off. To what extent is that relationship the same across the whole country, or the whole region, or the whole world? So, how can I go from my sample to talk about patterns that might be outside of the, the, the sample in, the, in um, people that I've not talked to? So, internal validity: Have I got the logical relationships, the patterns, the causality right within the sample that I have talked to? External validity: Can I generalise and talk about things that? Uh, may hold beyond the sample I've talked, to, talked about. Ecological validity, that comes back to the problem from the first slide of James, uh, James's fish. How do I know that the, the, the concepts that I'm talking about, the way I use those concepts, is the same or corresponds closely to the way that they're actually used in people's everyday lives? So if when I talk about education, I'm talking about the cognitive ability that people have gathered, but it could be that the way that education is talked about um, in a village is purely the number of years or purely the attainment of primary or secondary level whereas the quality, the cognitive ability, the ability to apply the subjects they've learned may not be what people in the a local area are talking about or it could be the other way around. So are there other ways the concepts are used and the, conce and the choice of concepts that I use in my research, does that correspond with um, the way that things are used in reality, ecological validity? Um, now, throughout this discussion of different kinds of research um, design, we'll look at a, a typology, so different types, and I'll use this kind of notation, which is quite widely used among this, in discussions of research design, to try and distinguish between um, the ways that, that the logical structures that I was talking about that we can use in different forms of research. And it's, you could refer to it as the NRXO, there, there, are other, there are some other letters that come in as well, uh, but these are the main ones. Now here, in this situation, O is an observation. So it could be direct measurements. You go and measure somebody's crops. Yeah? So what's the crop yield? Oh, I'm going to make a fool of myself. Again, this spelled wrong. Let's hope that's right. Crop yield. Yeah? Or you could wear a baby. Yeah? If you're into nutrition, you know, mother, and, mother and, and child welfare, you can weigh babies direct measurements. So that's you measuring with your scales some dried crops or... Uh, a baby and a set of baby, baby measuring scales or so on. Yeah. Or you can have questions and response so you can ask. So this is from your interviews. And there could be some overlap. So you could do a crop yield. You can ask people, how many bags of, of grain did you get last year? Yeah. Or when did your baby attain the normal weight or something? Yeah. So that's observations. X is an intervention. It's something you do. And I'll put some examples here. It could be a child's given inoculation. It could be village tax reduced. Could be the exchange rate is cut. Could be um, you know, a, a road is resurfaced. Um, a different political party introduces a new policy. So X is something that's done. Then we have these other things: allocation. Because in studies, uh, comparisons between groups uh, turn out to be quite crucial in these research designs. So where you have different groups in your study, R means that individuals have been randomly allocated to the groups. N means that they've been put in this group, but not by a process that we can describe as random. And as you'll see, that when, when this um, is used, when we go along to the right, that means that this is time going along this way, and different groups are written above each other, below each other. Probably best to show that with examples. So that's the NRXO notation. Let's put some flesh on this one example. Uh, quite an interesting example to myself. I used to teach in a secondary school in Tanzania. And the theory here is that could it be that one thing which is a barrier to girls' enrolment in schools 
uh, could be the presence of decent toilet facilities. So this, could, this is put forward as something that affects both girls and boys, but specifically girls. Yeah? And specifically girls because um, their parents may be worried about the girls' um, privacy and the girls being safe when they're away from school, perhaps walking a long way or even overnight somewhere. And of course, then when girls get to the age when they have menstruation, they're particularly sensitive. But so this is something that applies to both girls and boys, but particularly to girls. Um, now, there's two ways we can assess this claim. Is, are, is the provision of good, clean toilet facilities going to have any effect on girls' enrolment or attendance at school? Now, there's two different ways I'm going to contrast here of examining this claim. And they're both based on some evidence that you may get from schools in a poor rural region. Now, the first design is this one. It's an OXO design. So there's one, only one group, and this is the flow of time this way. Now, in this design, first we measure girls' attendance here. Then there are some improved toilets are put in, X, that's the intervention. And after that, girls' attendance is measured again, O. Okay. And clearly, what we're going to do is, is there an improvement from this O to this O? That's the, that's the design here. There's another way we could have done this. This is the second design. First, some school officials, some, some officials, local education authority officials that know the area, they could have divided the schools into two groups. So this is non-random division of the schools into two groups. Then, the first group is given improved toilets, X. The second group received nothing. And the time is going this way. So the first group, is, first is allocated, then they get toilets. The second group allocated, they get nothing. And then at the end, whenever it is, after a year or six months, you then look at attendance again measure attendance in both groups. The second group that receives nothing, that's known as the control group. And this is a crucial bit of language that you need to get familiar with. The group that has no intervention is called the control group. And then you measure attendance in both groups. Now, before we go any further, because this is a screencast lecture, you can pause it at this point and think, what are the pros and cons of these designs? Are there any things that occur to you as being particular strengths of one of these methods or weaknesses? And what are they? Now let's look in at the implications of these two uh, examples. So, these two methods in this example. We have two simple designs here. There's a before and after design. It's the first one, which is before and after. So you measure before, that's the O. Then you put some toilets in, and then you measure afterwards, so before and after. Okay, clearly, this does measure change, because you're measuring the difference between here and here, because you've got an observation before and after. You can measure the change. Unfortunately, what you don't know is how much of that change, if you find attendance has gone up, would attendance have gone up if this had not happened? So that's a disadvantage. The advantage is you're, you've got a, something to compare it with, so you can measure the change. The disadvantage is, was the change down to this or not, or would it have happened anyway? Okay. With and without, well, here you've got a comparison group. That's how you write it, for some reason. You have the comparison here, so you, by comparing these two, that enables you to to assess the intervention, the group that has got the toilets, are they better than those? Yeah, so what's the difference here? But the change isn't measured because you didn't do a, pre, a, a what's called a pretest, so you don't know anything about here. You don't know whether or not they, they were different already. And the other problem is you don't know whether or not, if this one turns out as bigger, if this is bigger here, if that turns out big and that turns out small, is this difference due to the fact that this intervention took place, there's more girls going to school here than here, or was there more, were there more girls going to school here in the first place? It could be the difference between the groups rather than the difference, rather than the difference of the, what you've done, the intervention. Yeah. So both these designs have got the, don't address the problem of the counterfactual, which is what would have happened without the intervention? Is it the intervention that made the difference, or is it something else? If you can't deal with the problem of the counterfactual, then you, you're very limited in the claims that you can make. Because you can claim, well, look, there's toilets, and now the girls are doing well, 
but it's always open to someone else to say, well, that would have happened anyway, or that would have happened anyway here, or the girls in the schools that got the toilets, they, their attendance was better anyway. So they don't quite nail the problem of the counterfactual. So, having had looked at that simple example of a before and after, as opposed to a with and without research design, let's look at the typology I want to present. Now, the first type of research I look at is what's called non-experimental research design. And sometimes this is called descriptive research design. But I'd ask you to be aware here, as in many things in the social sciences, perhaps even more than in many areas, terminology that you'll find when you read about this is not consistent. Yes. Sometimes descriptive research design is not taken to me exactly the same as non-experimental research design. Other people treat these two terms as the same thing. All agree, though, that non-experimental research design gives you a very weak claim for, base, for claims about causality. So it's not a basis for making claims about the, evalu about the effect of any intervention. So if you're trying to evaluate something, a non-experimental research design is not ideal. It's, for example, some development intervention. Also, there's an agreement that this is not really a, a basis for generalisation. So you can't generalise beyond the sample you happen to have talked to. Now, in terms of our validities, that means that internal validity and external validity are not really going to be satisfied by a descriptive research design or a non-experimental research design, unless you can supplement them with other things other quantitative arguments which are experimental or qualitative arguments which are uh, can be generalised. So, if we stick with a purely non-experimental research design then, these things are hard to achieve. Typically we'd just be using descriptive techniques, so just some simple figures, averages, percentages, just to litter throughout your text or perhaps put in tables or charts. Um, for example, Non-experimental research design is well suited to a case study. Because in a case study, you're not primarily concerned or centrally concerned with generalising, coming up with general things that apply to other cases. You may want later on to come and compare your case with other cases, but that's not the main argument you're trying to make. And you'll actually find that non-experimental quantitative research designs, which we're talking about today, these often crop up in studies which are otherwise qualitative. For example, this which was carried out by a couple of um, anthropologists um, in Malawi uh, last year, most of their research was in-depth, qualitative interviews with people. They're talking about perception of poverty. But in amongst, they put some quantitative statistics which they gathered. They'd done a survey of the, the people in the two villages. And these, these are the results of the survey. Namasalima village, that's in one of the villages, and they're comparing this with the national figures they've got from the stats office, as I put down here. Um, and one common example, one common use of this um, researching, of this method in qualitative studies, is locating particular cases that you're talking to, or individuals you're talking to. For example, if you were to talk to some family who had uh, neither a, a bicycle nor a pit latrine, Compared with the rest of the village, well, now almost everybody's got pit latrines. Or, uh, uh, almost four-fifths of the village got pit latrines, and almost half have got bicycles. So some of them got neither of these things. It's really, the reader can tell that they're one of the poorer, in terms of possessions, or one of the poorer groups. Similarly, if you're talking to someone who, who has got both a radio and a bicycle and a pit latrine, then, you know, or who's got a main floor of cement, you can see they're in the top 10%. So this allows the, the reader of the interviews to locate the people you're talking to compared to the rest of the village. And it also allows them to help starting to relate the, the case study, although formally you can't generalise from it. These figures give you some idea on how comparable this village is with rural areas as a whole. You can see it's pretty close. Yeah. 
So it helps you locate individuals within your case study and it helps you locate that case study with regard to other areas. So quantitative material is often used in case studies. Um, and the, both the examples I've put here are very modern ones, uh, mainly because all the many, many classic, classic anthropological works, such as you know, Polly Hill and so on, their works uh, contain many such figures and diagrams, but um, they're not available electronically. Um, so here's one from my own research in Tanzania. Um, again, this, this is just from a simple survey of everybody in the village, a census of everybody in the whole village, looking at demographics, how many people live in each household of, of different ages. And this is what's called a population pyramid. Um, and I was at the, the grey area is in the village, so I was able to see that, for example, here about just under six percent of people in the village are between 20 and 24 years old and female. That's in my village, but compared to the national in urban areas, there'd be slightly more than that, but in rural areas in the country, there'd be slightly fewer. So the dotted area, the dotted lets you compare with Tanzania's rural average. The solid area at the end, the white area, is Tanzania's urban average. And you can see there's quite a few areas where the, the village is somewhere in between them, the, the, the two. Yeah. So again, that just allowed me to locate my village in in terms of other areas and say, well, make an argument that this growing village is somewhere between the rural average and the uh, urban area average for Tanzania. Non-experimental research design, we can write using this typology as XO or just O for an observation. And Examples of X that could be used for a non-experimental research design could be something like this, a famine, a flood, a war, an earthquake. In other words, it's an intervention, but it's not necessarily an intervention by the researcher. It's almost an intervention of nature. So something's happened, and you want to go along and see what's the situation like after it's happened. And O is just taken to describe the effect. You're not trying to show that X is the cause. For example, if you go to an area after there's been a famine there, or go and look at after a flood or a war and you see there's, there's people that are very hungry, houses have been knocked over, there, there have been deaths, uh, again, holes in the street. If you go and do some research in an area like that in the immediate aftermath, the point is not really to show that these buildings are lying down because there's been an earthquake. You're not trying to show the cause. What you're trying to do is show the situation that's happened after the earthquake, show how bad the situation is, what the needs are, so that then something can be done about it. So you're trying to uh, describe the effects rather than to show that that is the effect because no one's really seriously going to claim that the buildings would have fallen down if there was no earthquake. So you're not concerned with causality, you're concerned with precise description of what the situation is. Yeah? Which is why the X can or doesn't, doesn't have to be put in there. Um, for further examples you may like to refer to a car uh, in 2008, a study in Ghana of the difference between the women's crops and men's crops and the extent to which those categories are meaningful or helpful. And in order to help illustrate that, Carr used some very simple descriptive quantitative data um, looking at different types of households and the, the, the different cropping pattern between male and female households. And in some cases, there seems to be uh, a difference between them. In other cases, really, there were other characteristics of the household which were more important. And Carr argued that, that the gender is not such a useful um, category in the case of those households. Similarly, there's the, the, the ladder project, big project centered on UAA carried out in the late 90s, early 2000s, which is described in your manuals. Both of these are examples of non-experimental research designs. Here's CARS data. This is an example of the sort of um, very, very simple quantitative diagram that it produced. Um, well, there's it's a descriptive chart of, of sorts where you can see the numbers are quite small. It's saying, look, here's the people that, uh, that grew garden egg, which I take to mean aubergines, um, pepper, tomato, how many men grew it, how many women eat it. And there was a, a, a colour-coded typology that but people that sell more than they eat, so most of, the, most of their crop is marketed, coloured in this dark colour. If it's roughly the same, it's in this intermediate colour. If they eat much more than they sell, it's a light colour. So this was an example where there was much more difference between men and women. Most, in all these categories of plants, 
in these particular types of households, um, men are doing it primarily as a marketing to, to earn income. Whereas primarily here, the women are either doing it for provisioning yeah, or mix that, mixing that with, with marketing. It's, it's only with maize that that was mostly a, a cash crop. So again, the research can have a lot of uh, qualitative interview, interviews with people, but a simple bit of, of um, quantitative data like this can help present any patterns that you think you've found in your results. We can look at the characteristics of um, research designs for non-experimental designs and ask to what extent these things are satisfied. Um, reliability, well, there's no reason why it shouldn't be reliable. It's just a matter of making sure that your measurements are uh, reliable and that it, um, if you were to go there the next day and measure the same person, and ask them, you, you would get something that reflects the concept in the same way, so you get consistent results. Replicability, um, a slightly harder one. You should, it should be the case that other people can come into your context or a very similar context and get the similar results. But, of course, whether or not they can repeat the context, in, repeat your research in different um, areas is more questionable. So we're not sure about that one. Depends to what extent the, con the, the concepts you use are completely specific to the area you're working in. But it's validity where there's, there's more difference. The construct validity is fine you know, to the extent that your, your measurements, measurements really capture what you're trying to measure, but these are the ones that are problematic. Yeah. Um, you can't say much about um, causality, so internal validity, and you can't say much about external validity. You can't generalize beyond the sample that you've talked to. Yeah. And ecological validity, well again, it's, it's, possible, it's possible you can attain ecological validity, um, but then you know, it's hard to pronounce yes or no on that, but on these two here you can definitely say are in doubts. Right, next we're going to look at experimental research design, and we start here with a bang. Yeah. If you look at these three uh, images, they all correspond to an area of human inquiry, and I'd like you to think about which you think is the odd one out here. I have to pause the recording for a second and think, which one do you think is the odd one out? Now for me, if we're thinking of research design and thinking of the kind of research that arrives in these two things, well, in this case here, if we're trying to establish that there's some causality, vaccine license here, this is when the measles vaccine was licensed, number of cases in thousands, well, you don't need it. Well, you could try, but you don't need an awful lot of advanced statistics to make some sort of plausible argument. There's a kind of relationship here. Yeah? You can see it. Vaccines introduced, zonk, goodbye measles. Yeah? So a clear effect. Here, really, only the most severe postmodernists would argue that there was no effect between pressing the button and shadonk, something happens. Yeah? There's definitely an effect in this case. This one, well... I'm sure we'd all like to claim that the um, capabilities model of Martia Sen has had great effects in the world, but it's, you can't quite get to this kind of zap, you know, factor of, of showing that it's uh, that uh, there have been effects from this model, the use of this model. What sort of research gets used in these areas? And that's what we're going to look at next. Well, it's experimental research design now. Is experimental research design seen as, or is it going to be come to be seen as, the gold standard? Not only for the natural sciences and medical sciences, but for social sciences. If this is true, is it partly because it's so ubiquitous in the natural sciences, which have got so much more prestige, because they have... You know, are we just jealous of the natural sciences and the demonstrable effect they've had, the fantastically transforming effect they've had on the world, whether for good or questionably for good, they've definitely had an effect, whereas what effect of, of social sciences had. Is that part of the reason why experimental research design is being seen as a gold standard for empirical research? Yeah. Natural sciences is everywhere, more recent and limited in social sciences. It's coming in, it's being used more where causality is a central concern, of course for us, causality is a central concern, where we want to see what's the effect of an intervention. If our NGO has brought a project into an area, come out five years later, has there been an effect? 
with the toilets problem. Has there been an effect? Has that had an effect? A policy change on a national level, has that had an effect on poverty or on growth or on living standards? The question is, why is it difficult to establish? And as we saw with both the attempts to solve the to school toilets problem, they boil down to the, the problem of the counterfactual. Why is it that even though it's pretty tough to get a, a nuclear bomb to go junk, and it's pretty tough to knock out measles, why is it you can do that? Whereas in the social sciences, it's particularly difficult to really pin down causality. What's tough about that? And again, perhaps a good time to pause, think, why is it tough to get to this kind of level of prediction and confidence about causality in the social sciences? Why is it? Or is it that social sciences are just not so able? Is it because all the smart people go into science and medicine? Or is there something about what we're trying to do in social sciences that makes it hard to get to causality? Well, of course, one of the main things which makes it far, far harder in the realm of natural sciences is that there are many, many other factors at work all the time. It's really hard to separate them out. For example, in the case of girls' toilets, there are so many other things which can influence a girl's attendance at school. I've written down some of them here. The distance to the school, the attainment of those girls, religion, wealth, facilities. You can write down several others. It's possible to think of reasons why all of these things could affect school attendance. We want to know what's the effect of just toilets. Is it possible to isolate that effect? How on earth are we going to do that? If we move to a, some sort of um, group study, so this would be a with and without study. So with improved toilets, without. Here's the difference between X and nothing. Here's the observation afterwards. We find higher attendance here, lower attendance here. The problem is, does this show there's causality from improved toilets to higher girls' attendance? We split them into two different groups. The only thing that we've made different is here. We get this difference in the observation. Can we say that this difference in observation is due to this difference? And of course, it's really tough to do that because we don't know whether or not these things have each had a, a similar effect. Yeah. So we can't conclude there's causality between toilets and the tenants unless we know that the influence of all these other factors is the same for each group. And how is it possible? Because the wealth, the family size, the attainment, they might have been different for each of those two groups. Well. How is it possible? Well, we don't know the influences of these factors. We don't know what influence teach quality or family size has on attendance. And we also don't even know if this is the right list. Perhaps some of these things have no effect. Perhaps there are a whole load of things we should have put here, which we've missed out. So we may have missed some factors. We don't know the influence of these factors. So it's a tough position to be in. The solution in experimental design is what's known as the randomized controlled trial. Now, in a randomized controlled trial, you begin with all the schools to which you have access, say in this rural area, and you allocate them into two groups. The crucial thing is the allocation is random, so by a computer or by throwing dice literally or drawing names out of a hat of schools. You put the schools into two groups. So if the schools originally had a whole lot of other factors, perhaps you don't even know what the factors are, then each group will have the same kind of factors. But you don't, again, you don't know the effect of these, what the factors are, are important, how many factors there are, and so on. They're unknown factors, possibly, certainly unknown effects. But the crucial thing is this. If we now consider the two groups like this again, if the allocation is done randomly, then it's possible to show that we expect each, each of these unknown factors will have a similar range of values in each group, as long as we've done it randomly. Because there's no reason to think that girls that live particularly far from school, those the girls that live particularly far away would have gone into this group rather than this group. Some of them would have gone into each. Some of the, the, the ones that are of really below average wealth, there'd be some in each group, some rich ones in each group, some average, one, average ones in each group. Same for the other factors. So there could be some small differences, but overall the range of values for each individual factor, including the ones we don't even know about, would be the same in each group, as long as it's a random. Therefore, the effect that all these things have on higher attendance or lower attendance, that should be the same. So the effect of these red arrows should be the same in each group if it's random selection. Therefore, if we find there is some difference here, 
more than a, more than a small difference, then that must be due to this thing which we know is different. We know we've made this difference, so that must be driving any substantial difference we find. And that's how random controlled trials work. That's how we can eliminate the effects of all these unknown things, all the things here, we don't know what the effect is, we don't even know if we've got the whole list. Random allocation in principle should solve all of that. This is how it's written in terms of this symbology. First of all, we have random allocations to two groups. Then you do an intervention. This is putting the toilets in. Here's nothing. And then you observe. That's stated here. Now we'll look at two examples of actual RCT research in the wild. First of all, though, I recommend that you pause the screencast for a few seconds and just consider what you think the pros and cons are. Are there any things that occur to you would be particularly good about this or problems, doubts you have about it, for the study of development questions particularly. Before considering the pros and cons, we'll move below the water into the world of concrete uh, experience and look at some actual studies that have been carried out. So, the first one is carried out by, by Brood and Linden, published in 2009, on Afghan schools. And the question here was, does having a local school as opposed to a school in a neighbouring village, a neighbouring town down the road, does having a school particularly near, right in your village, does that have a measurable effect on education? Does that improve education? And they looked at an area in northwest, northwest Afghanistan where there were 31 villages, villages which had no school. Now, of these 31, 13 of them were chosen at random. It wasn't chosen by local officials. The names were put on a long list, the 31, and they, the 13 were chosen randomly from that. Now, the 13 that were chosen then were had new schools built in them, even though well, the schools are quite rudimentary sometimes. It was a, just a, a very simple building, but they were provided with new schools, resources for teachers and so on. Now, that's called the treatment group because something was done to them. So the, school, the, the villages that received the new schools are the treatment group. The remaining 18 villages who didn't get new schools, they were the control group. And then after a year, uh, the researchers came along again and they did a, a survey of educational participation and outcomes. So not only did they look at how many boys and girls were enrolled, but how many boys and girls actually attended and whether or not their skills had improved in terms of literacy and numeracy tests. So that was the observation afterwards. Here's the X, here's the nothing, and here's the observation afterwards. This is the R bit here. What they found in the observation was that in the 13 treatment group schools, overall enrolment had gone up by 42 percentage points. Um, test scores were substantially higher in the schools which had got the, um, in the villages where schools had been built compared to the places where they still had to go to the neighbouring villages. And these two are true for both sexes. Big increase in enrolment, big increase in test scores. But when you look only at girls, the improvements were even more than among boys. So we had strongly desirable results. Here's a second example. This is an example from Malawi, again. Um, this is published by Brune et al. in 2011 on savings accounts. And the context of this is farmers that grow on contracts to um, tobacco exporting companies. I think, it's, I think this is one particular company in this case. And they're grouped together in groups of or clubs of 15. And the idea is that the, the clubs of 15 routinely are given uh, credit for inputs and they grow their crops together, they sell their crops as a group of 15 to the tobacco country a company, you then pay one representative of that club who then spreads the money around from the tobacco crop each year, having deducted any credits for inputs. So they're already organised into these groups of 15. Now there were 127 of these clubs, and they were randomly allocated into three groups this time, not two, but three. Two treatment groups and one control group. One treatment group were offered a saving account. So it was help with setting up the savings accounts, they're also well, given savings advice, as we'll see. So they got savings account and savings advice. A second group were offered both a savings account and a commitment savings account. Now, in the commitment one, any money they chose to put into the commitment savings account, they were then not going to be allowed to take any money out of that until just before the next planting season started. That's why it's called commitment savings account. And all of the groups, all three of the groups, got this advice on savings and the importance of savings account. And, of course, it was open for... Anyone in this group could have chosen to take a commitment account out. Anyone in the control group could have chosen to take a savings account out if they wanted to, but here they were provided with it in the first two treatment groups. 
And what did they find? The observations, the O was a year later, the start of the next planting season, and they found that the, the farmers in the commitments group, the ones that had the commitment, they couldn't take the money out even if they wanted to. They had higher levels of savings in their accounts compared to either of the other groups. They were cultivating more lands. They were using more inputs, more fertilizers, pesticides and so on um, uh, to cultivate. The value of their harvest when they finally sold it had total, higher total value. And they also had higher levels of expenditure, which when you first hear it, you think that sounds bad because that means they were able to spend stuff on, on you know, food, um, clothes, education, things like this. They, could, they had higher levels of consumption, in other words, that means. So again, a whole set of desirable things, substantially different for this group of commitment savings groups, um, farmers. The ordinary savings treatment group farmers that just got given the savings account, they really had no difference, or only very small differences that, that could have just been down to random chance. All theirs were very similar to the control group. So this, the other treatment group and the control group had very similar results. It's only the group that had these commitment accounts that had better results than the others. Now, before, the, before you play the next slide, you might want to pause it and think, well, why does a commitment account um, have any effect like this compared to an ordinary savings account or nothing? The two explanations that were given by the researchers, uh, the first is a fairly standard explanation, um, which they considered was that if a farmer puts the money away into a savings account, a commitment savings account, then even if they themselves want to then use it for consumption, you know, for alcohol or for other nice consumption or just for food, they won't be able to do that if they put it into the commitments accounts. So they'll force themselves to keep it until the next planting season comes along and then they'll be able to use it during that very uh, hungry season for either buying new inputs um, or for buying consumption things they need rather than taking out loans, say, from local moneylenders. The other one, the other explanation is that um, farmers, if they can put money into commitment accounts, or at least claim they put money into commitment accounts, it makes it harder for um, relatives um, or other people that depend upon them to claim a share of that money if they have any needs themselves. Um, it's thought that strong norms, op norms operate in this area that makes it very difficult for people to accumulate savings because there will always be some disaster somewhere in their family or some need um, for, for that cash and according to the norms that operate in the area, you can't then keep hoarding it. You have to use it. If you have some savings, you have to make that available to your relatives if they demand your help. But if you can say, well, I'd love to help, but it's in my commitment account, then that enables you to defend against that. So you can keep the money until you really need it uh, in the next um, hungry season before the planting starts. So those are the explanations they gave. And that they actually favour the second explanation about the ability of farmers to resist social um, demands. Having looked at these two examples, we can now consider the criticisms of RCTs that have been made. And the first two are the, the biggest ones that crop up again and again. The first is practicability, uh, particularly the resources involved, as well as things like time. For example, in the Afghan schools case, obviously the researchers there had to be prepared to marshal the resources necessary to build extra schools in 13 villages and to help employ teachers and so on. Um, so that rules out uh, the kind of approach, traditional approach of a single researcher going around with a clipboard doing, some, doing a survey or asking questions. How can a PhD researcher, or a single researcher or an MA, MA dissertation writer, how can they possibly have enough resources to uh, use this approach? Because you have to be able to put in enough resources to really change the lives of people in a significant way in order to be able to measure it. And what researchers can do that on their own? Ethics, in the Afghan case again, 18 of the schools got nothing at all. Um, 18 of the villages, sorry, got nothing at all, whereas 13 villages got completely new schools. Is it ethical to, de to deny effectively resources to half the, the villages or half the people in your study um, just so that you can create a, a situation where you can measure your effect you're trying to measure? Is that ethical to do that? A particularly thorny question in the, in the case of medical interventions where you'd be denying treatment to half of your people half the people that you in your study. So you can see if there's a difference between the ones that get nothing and the ones that get treated. Here are some other criticisms that have been made. One is that uh, because interventions are inevitably artificial, you're interfering in a, a context, unless you can be completely sure that in, in other contexts, um, the, context would be, the context would be sufficiently similar so the effect would be the same, that necessarily means that you can't generalize. In that, in, in that particular context, you did something, but how can you know that 
the, the, the same action would do the same thing in somewhere else. So that means makes generalization very hard to achieve. It could be that what you've measured um, would only work in that particular context. Similarly, consistence, treatment consistency is hard to ensure. How do you know that if you do it somewhere else, uh, it, will, it, it would have the same effect or it would be the same treatment? So um, getting a, a new way of farmers planting their crops in one particular area, supervised by extension workers, when you roll that out across a whole country, are you going to have the resources to make sure that extension workers are standing next to the people and in the same way perhaps they were during the trial? Um, similarly, even during the trial itself, is it possible that because it's not what's called um, double-blinded, because um, it's very difficult for you to ensure that people working on the trial, people doing the measurements, people offering the interventions, they know who's getting the intervention and who isn't. There could be other ways they're treating people which are different, which lead to the differences between the two groups rather than the intervention itself. So how can you be sure that the treatment is consistent between groups and, and, and outside of the case? Next, uh, a lack of theoretical insights, because this is not tied to any theoretical insight, this, this method, it's purely empirical. You divide your study into two groups and see if there is a difference. You don't explain why there is a difference at all between the, the um, schools which have toilets and the schools which don't have toilets or the villages where there are schools put in, the villages where there are not, or similarly for the, the commitment accounts and not a commitment accounts. That's left for you to do afterwards to try and explain it. The research design itself gives you no insight into that. It just tells you there is or there isn't a difference. Um, and it's that lack of theoretical insight that then makes it hard to generalise, even harder to generalise to what, what might happen somewhere else. All you know is it happened in that particular place on that occasion. Does that tell you anything about whether it might happen somewhere else? These last two, then, in terms of validities, imply there could be a trade-off. The greater the internal validity, the more you match up what's happened and explain it in terms of that particular case, the characteristics of that case study, the more specific it becomes, so the harder it is to say that it applies elsewhere. In other words, the more you hammer down causality that's happened within your sample, in that specific context, that might make it harder to argue in other places where the context is not exactly the same, the details are different. And for me, certainly, it echoes the distinctions people make between qualitative and quantitative comparisons. That Qualitative can really give you a very rich description of what happens in one place, but tough to generalise. Quantitative, excellent for generalising, but do you really make, can you really measure everything that really happens in terms of the detail in a particular situation? So is this a case study uh, and then general survey methods approach, like generalised approach? Uh, but as we've already seen, I think that, that's a distinction that's pretty too harsh to make. Um, partly in response to these criticisms, there are a number of variations of RTCs, and again, in literature, sometimes these are then not called RCTs, but we'll call them variations on RTC, RCT. But they're all experimental designs. Um, the first one's called the, the pretest post test design, and in actual fact, this is quite an obvious thing to do, and in fact, it was done in, in all the RCTs examples that I've given, the real ones, is that you do measure beforehand as well as after. So you can tell, you can measure more precisely any difference that's happened. So that's, that's called a pretest post test design. Put a pretest in here and a post test in here. That enables you to do a number of, of control in a number of ways um, for things that, for the causality that might have been caused by this as compared to differences in other things. Because some of these other factors we're talking about, like wealth, education, um, ethnicity, infrastructure, that can be picked up in this study here. So you can compare differences between the two groups in those things. To, to differences in attendance or whatever the outcomes are at the end and try and adjust for those. Switching replication, um, in other words, it's got a pipeline effect, which is that instead of differentiating between the groups saying this group gets some and this group doesn't, it's as though they're being put down a pipeline in different order. So this, these are first down the pipe, they get the intervention here, these people get the intervention here. The advantages are it gives you an extra chance again to do some more measurements, see if there's still a difference. Gives you a chance to see, to compare, did this group improve when they got it and, and then this group did they also improve when they got it it wasn't just an inherent difference this group doing better also of course it, it goes a long way to addressing your ethical concerns which is that okay in the afghan case they're all going to get schools in the end which is actually the case for the afghan example they all get schools in the end of the day but just these schools were built first in those 13 villages these 18 were built later it could be if you haven't got the resources to build more at once why not do this sort of design 
Then there's a Solomon four group design, which is you do the, the RCT twice. First, the, the kind of pure one with no pretest, and then the, uh, at the same time, sorry, the one with the pretest. This is designed to, to address the possibility that the test itself could have effects, or perhaps people learn what you're looking for in the test, and that affects the way they answer the test the next time. Yeah. So if the test has an effect on the test result afterwards, you, you can, the control group for this one is here, in a sense. Yeah. If there was an improvement here, do you get the same kind of level of scores here as you do here, or are these better because they've learned to do well on the test, or learn what you're looking for? And simply, are these better than these? So it lets you control for the pre-test, post-test effect, as well as for the effect of the intervention if there is one. So those are all variations on random controlled trials. The final group of research designs we look at are called quasi-experimental um, research designs. Now, what are quasi-experimental research designs and why are they needed? Well, some things that we want to consider, they can't be allocated. Yes, either randomly or by a researcher or in any way, they're beyond our control. Gender, ethnicity, caste as examples. You, you can't decide which one you're going to put someone into. So it's not practical to do an experiment. Similarly, the other big one was ethics. might not be ethical. If you have a treatment that you're pretty sure is going to um, save for very sick children, but you just want to test it and make sure and see how well it works, there's no way you're going to be denying it to people on, on the throw of a dice. That would, that would clearly be wrong. What is it? Well, um, quasi or quasi means almost or nearly. So this is just means it's nearly experimental research. It's just experimental research design with a slight tweak. One of the tweaks is that you usually assume that nature or something outside of your control is making the intervention. So it could be there's been a flood or a drought or nature as in the markets have put exchange rates up or the government. Something that's out of your control has made an intervention. And then the key factor really is that you have to use statistical techniques for allow for non-random allocation. You can't randomly allocate groups, or it's not ethical to allocate random groups. So you use statistical techniques to allow for the fact they're not random. Or you can assume that they've been allocated randomly by nature. And this, this one is called a, a natural experiment. There's an example, and this one, the first example is of a, a natural experiment where nature does this randomization. Here's, here's the research design as it was. This one's in uh, a really classic study done by Sabo and Knight, in, in well, Bossier Sabo and Knight, back in 1985. And it's in post independence Kenya and Tanzania. And their argument was that, in terms of many variables, Kenya and Tanzania were really similar, really similar resources, like agriculture and minimal, mineral wealth. Not, not far off in terms of population size and so on. Similar colonial experience, um, certainly at least after the First World War, the British um, dependency and colony respectively. Similar, similar economic structures. Um, but one big difference was the post-primary educational policies. After independence, Kenya did a fairly standard expansion, around 30%, I, think, I can't remember when they were, the 20 years after they reached about 30%. Tanzania was still well under 5% 30 years later because they made a deliberate decision that, according to Nueri's uh, philosophy, if most of the population is involved in agriculture, there's no need to be training a whole lot of technicians and accountants. What they need is uh, education relevant to subsistence or um, agriculture, you know, or simple cash crop agriculture. So they deliberately decided not to build lots of secondary schools, whereas Kenya, like most um, other sub-Saharan African countries, did expand secondary education. So it's a natural experiment, because anyone that's born in East Africa in, or in those two countries is randomly allocated by nature, either they're Kenyan or Tanzanian. So nature has done the random allocation. So then they looked at the difference in cognitive ability. They measured literacy and um, numeracy directly by applying tests, and also earnings between countries arguing that there'd be a link between um, the education and achievement of people and earnings. They used these to claim that um, different education policies have had, had effects on both these things, on the actual level of cognitive abilities and the actual earnings between countries. They also argued it to use it to argue against a credentialist view. A credentialist view is that um, if somebody gets a good job because they have secondary education, it's not because of the qualities that the secondary education gives them that they have the job, but just because in that society um, the, the social arrangements are such that secondary jobs go to people with secondary education. And you could get someone that just bought their secondary education qu qualification by bribery or something, and they'd still get the job because what's needed is just a piece of paper, it's just a credential. 
and they showed that it really was an effect of cognitive ability by these direct tests that caused that difference. So this was a natural experiment in East Africa. Uh, other quasi-experimental uh, designs are non-equivalent design, group designs where you've simply taken the, um, the, the random um, post-test, pre-test and replaced the R with the N. So it would be RO. So instead of random allocation, either um, you've allocated or some official has allocated to the two groups. Yeah? Now, this is the one where it gets tricky because in this situation, you can't assume that these two groups are equivalent. It could be that whoever's done the allocation has, has done it in a biased way in some way that, so that group, people that live in a certain area, certain ethnicities, certain religions have, have been more favoured by this intervention and others have been left out. So you can't assume that all these other factors are similar because there's not been a random allocation. So it could be that the group difference is driving the difference in observations rather than X. So it caused, could directly cause a difference in the observations, and it could change, even though you've got the, post, the pretest and the post-test here, you can't argue that all this difference here, if that's different from that, you can't argue it's all down to X, because this group might have been a group that was changing, or is changing at a higher rate than this one anyway. There's two popular approaches to, to statistically compensating for this are the difference in differences, or propensity score matching. And I'll briefly outline the, the details of this. You, you need to know these to follow some recent debates, but they can get extremely complicated. This is the logic behind the difference in differences, or diff in diff design. And the example we'll take is, suppose we're, we have an intervention X, which could be a feeding program, or the initiation of mother and child clinics. We want to see whether or not that, in, that intervention is going to affect nutrition levels. Now, let's suppose that we have um, two non-randomly allocated control and treatment groups. We start with looking at the control group, and that's the group that does not have the intervention, whatever it is. Let's suppose that they start off with the initial nutrition level of B, B for baseline, say. Now, the treatment group they start off with an initial nutrition level, which is, we'll assume, is, is B plus F. So B is the same baseline that everybody else has, but because we're no longer going to assume that, on average, they're the same as the other group, there may be some other factors, be the, the wealth of the families, the religion of the families, the education of the families, but some other factors which we may not even know about mean that instead of starting at level B, the treatment group starts at level B plus F. So F is this effect due to other factors. Now, the control group, when you get to the end of the, the post-test, we find that their nutrition has changed from B to B plus T. It could be that T is nothing, or T could be positive, it's gone up, or it's gone down, if it's negative. But we're assuming that there may be some change in the control group between the first test and the second test. And the effect that is just due to time. So B plus the time, or perhaps you could say the, the trend, B plus the, the trend takes you to the control group's final level. So T is the change that would happen even without the intervention. So that's what happens to the control group. Finally, the treatment group, when you measure them at the end of the study and find out the nutrition level among those children, well, you can explain that by saying, well, it's what they started with, which is B plus F, because they're the control group, that's all the other factors, Plus, let's assume the same time trend would have happened to them as well. as what happens to the control group. But as well as those things, that also, there could have been an effect which is just due to our intervention. XC, we call that. X effect. And that XC, that's the effect you want to know. You're not really interested in all the other things, what they started as, the extra effect that group had, the trend that would have happened anyway without the intervention. What you want to know is... What is XC? So the question is, how can the difference in differences design single out from all these other factors the effects of the intervention? And we'll see that logic on the next slide. In fact, it's just a simple bit of maths. Not even maths, just arithmetic. If we, if we look at the observation, the um, research design like this, and number the observations, 
then this observation here on the control group, O3, that's just the baseline level. That's what everybody starts with. And then after they've had no intervention at all, they end up here with just what they start with, plus what happens anyway over time, the improvement over time. This other group, X, they don't start at B because they might be different. There could be a, a difference F because of this non-random allocation. And then after time has gone, they also get this extra bit of factor because time is changing. But then they also get any extra factor due to X. I mean, this could be nothing. Yeah? But whatever extra, extra effect this has, has to be added on to all the other effects. Now, it turns out, even though this looks horrible, if we do this calculation, which is subtract, look at this distant difference here from O2 to O1. So what's that difference? What was added on there? That gives us that. And what was added on here? So that one is that difference there. And that one is that difference there. If we look at the differences, the difference between those two differences, that's why it's called diff in diffs. So start with if difference and then take away that difference. Then that's, if you want to do the algebra, you can. If you, but if you take this and subtract that, well, that goes away, b minus b, that goes away and that goes away, and you're left with that. That's that part. And if you do this, take away this, well, that cancels that out. That, yeah. So that is that part. And the difference seen there and there, take those away, t plus x e minus t gives you that on its own x e. So the diff in diffs just gives you exactly what you want to know, the effect you wish to know. So look at the difference in improvement in each group, you get the improvement which is due to the intervention. And that's the diff in diffs argument. The other one I mentioned, propensity score matching, I'm afraid is an even more complicated one. It can get really quite heavy in terms of maths and stats. So I'll just give you a, a general outline of that. Um, propensity score matching, or PSM, that attempts to artificially create a control group, which is equivalent to the treatment group. Yeah. Now, there's several stages to it. A fine trick if you can do it. There's a several, several stages. First of all, you do a pretest in which you gather data on all the possible factors that you think could be relevant, both in the groups that you're going to treat and in the groups that you're not going to treat, the individuals you're not going to treat. Then you apply some sophisticated statistics um, regression analysis, to, and that gives you the probability that an individual with any given combination of factors, so any given wealth, distance to school, health, families, um, all sorts of things, um, gender, ethnicity, caste, location, nationalities, any group of factors, you can work out for someone that's got that particular group of factors, what's the chance they'd be in your treatment group? So, suppose there are six individuals who are female, aged 40 to 45, with primary education only. Yeah. Now, if two are in the treatment group, now the point is the treatment group has been allocated. You, that's Either you've done it um, without using a random process, or more likely, it's something like a microfinance um, initiative where the microfinance NGO has accepted applications from these two people here. So they're going to get a loan. The others are not. So we look at the six individuals. We look at these characteristics, their gender, their sex, their age and their education. And if we find that there are six individuals with these characteristics yeah, and only two of them have gone ahead and they've got these loans, then we can say that we assume that for any people with these characteristics there's a, a two in six or a one in a third chance of getting into the microfinance scheme. And you do the same thing with any other combination of factors. Of course there'd be a longer list of factors than this. So you go through each combination of factors and work out how many of the people with that combination of factors got into the NGO screen, or whatever it is, and how many didn't? And that gives you the probability. And that's done with a form of, of what's called regression analysis, which obviously you're not expected to know about at this stage. The probabilities are called propensity scores. So what's the chance that someone with those characteristics will be in the scheme, get the treatments? 
what you do then is you go through all the people that are in the scheme and match them up with people that are not in the scheme. The simplest form is you take, say, one of the women that's, that's got those characteristics who is in the microcredit scheme and just choose the one woman who's got the most similar score. It doesn't have to be one to one though, you could match several people in the treatment group with, or several people in the control group with one in the treatment group and so on. But in any case, whichever precise way you do it, you match up people that have got into the scheme and are going to have the treatment with people that are outside the scheme but have very similar characteristics yeah, that we would have expected would, have, would get into the scheme with the same probability. And then that group of people that you've matched with, that's then the control group. Yeah. And then you compare the outcomes that happen in the control group in the, with the outcomes that happen in the, in the treatment group in the usual ways. And you can either use, just look at the overall averages or look at the average of each one with its paired, you know, with, its, with its matched pair. Often it's combined with diff in diffs. Yeah. So you, you do this process, you get the control group, and then you do the difference in differences method. And the, the, the example of that that will be in your pack is the um, very topical one of microcredit where um, Dubendak and Palmer Jones in 2011 showed that you know, using this method it's not possible to establish that there is any uh, improvement in, in well-being um, due to membership in a microfinance scheme when you take all the other factors into account using this combination of propensity score matching and a different difference analysis. Um, finally, we mentioned others. Well, observational, and I say finally, but when we come to observational study or correlation analysis, again, there's some difference in terminology. In actual fact, here we're talking about the majority of survey result of research that's been carried out, especially in my own home discipline of econometrics, or econom economics, which relied on econometrics. Um, there are, these, these cannot claim really to be fully experimental, um, and they, they don't apply even the same sort of rigorous approaches that, that propensity score matching or different diffs apply, um, which is why some people say they're not exp experimental at all, they're just observational. Others that the correlation analysis only, implying that you can't say anything about causality from them. So heavily criticised, but very widespread because they're comparatively simple. It's simply a matter of carrying out a survey. But in terms of research design, they're quite weak and they're sort of very kind of very heavily criticised in recent years. Because you have here many factors randomised, not just an intervention, but many factors randomised all at the same time. So your survey will cover people of all different genders, education levels, occupations, histories, contraction engagement, all kinds of things, randomised by nature or by other event, events. And then you have to use really heavy, sophisticated techniques of various sorts, like analysis of various or regression, to try and simulate the counterfactual control. So you're trying to control for the differences in the variables you're less interested in, all those other factors, to see what the variables that you think are interested in, the effect they would have had. Data requirements of this are really high, because yeah, you have to have knowledge of all these different factors. But nevertheless, because they don't have the same um, practical implications in terms of resources and time as perhaps uh, experimental methods do, they have been very common in the past, and they continue to be quite common. Different designs will come across time series, where you do a server that collects data on one variable at a time, so you could be looking at an exchange rate. So today the exchange rate is um, 2,560 shillings, Tanzanian shillings to the pound, tomorrow it's 2,566, next day it's 2,700 and so on. That's a time series. Or a cross section, which is, for example, a simple village study, where at one point in time you, you apply a survey to a whole, a whole number of people, so it could be a whole village of individuals or look at the values of a particular set of variables across the whole world on a particular, for a particular year. Or then there's one that combines these two, which is panel data, where you have, um, instead of, well, this is much better illustrated in your textbooks, but instead of a, a time series that looks like this, you're analysing one thing over time, a time series, and a cross section would look like this. So you're analysing different things at one point in time, a panel would combine the two. And of course, panel brings its own advantages because you have much more data. You can analyse different effects within each year and then see how those go from year to year. So you can have some chance of getting at causality. But of course, the problem is what happens if you get to this stage here and this person either runs away or gets fed up with you or sadly dies? When you come to your next year, what do you do here? 
you have to have strategies for things like that. Yeah. So what's it about replacement? But these are the, conceptually the three main kinds of observational correlation analysis that are done with surveys. To conclude then, we've considered a range of quantitative research designs from simple descriptive designs to sophisticated statistics involved in the quasi-experimental um, designs. From a low-cost finished survey that can be carried out by an individual researcher, perhaps with a research assistant, all the way up to high-cost RCTs where there are heavy implications in terms of resources that need to be put in and scale. Will RCTs become the norm for policy evaluation, as some have argued that they should be? Or will the problems that have been identified with them by others, such as the, the lack of theoretical depth, the difficulty in generalizing beyond the case, as well as the, the clear problems of, of um, ethics and practicability, will those problems become insuperable, either in all cases or in many cases, or in some cases? Where does this leave the single PhD researcher or small-scale researcher? Is there a place for small-scale descriptive research? Are if we're not satisfied with small-scale survey research or RCTs, is there room for these things that sort of come in the middle, the quasi-experimental designs? Are they a good enough substitutes? Do we trust the high-powered, sophisticated maths and statistics enough to really compensate and to tell us what would have happened in the absence of interventions to really solve the counterfactual problem? Or is it an illusion to think there's one answer to all these questions and that what we need to do is to design the best possible um, experimental algorithm, the method that will take us from the sea of experience to some sort of pure policy advice theory that will always work. Is perhaps the best advice that we need to combine all these things and to repeatedly use our judgment when we're deciding which things that we will put our faith in. So, thank you for listening. That's been my discussion of quantitative research designs and on the next slide I'll leave you with the references from the, from the lecture. Thank you.